A lot of Half-Life mods get way too little attention, but today I tell you about the one that I believe to be the most criminally underrated mod to have ever released, with probably one of the coolest endings, if not one of the coolest scenes that I have ever seen in a Half-Life mod. I'm talking about 1187. In this video I'll be summarizing, analyzing and reviewing 1187 and actually report on some exclusive news from the sequel from the creator himself. So let's get right into it. 1187 has a total of 80,000 downloads, which is nothing to fuck at obviously, but these days it's never really mentioned anymore. The name 1187 was something I had heard very often but never really had a picture of, never really saw a video on it or a let's play, mainly due to it being really broken these days. 1187 was released in 2010 by Team GT, which is why it's so broken, the year not the team. It can be fully fixed though in a few steps. Here are the installation instructions as explained by Yoonjumper on Reddit, pause if you want to see them. Once we start the mod, there are some interesting new options and settings. The new options include things like view bobbing and motion blur and an alternate HUD. I chose to disable all of them, but it's great to have a choice. There is a training level as well, it's pretty fun and I'd recommend doing it. It is pretty hard though at times. It teaches you some new mechanics like having a melee attack with all your weapons and that you have no crosshair but instead an iron sight on all weapons. Starting the game, G-Man speaks to you using some classic voice lines, telling you that it's time to choose. Which I'm just gonna go ahead and say now means basically nothing for the rest of the story. We start in an apartment in what looks to be a town in the Netherlands. In case you're wondering how I was able to recognize this so quickly, you must be an American. This house is neatly decorated and peeking out of the window we get a pretty unique aesthetic. We also see hound eyes, which is cool. There aren't any signs of combine here, but there are some zen life forms. Moving out of our apartment, which is the only one with a flipped number by the way, we find dead bodies lying in the stairwell alongside barnacles. At this point you might be thinking that this mod takes place in some alternate universe, but nope, this will all make sense in a bit. Try to get out of this building, we find a knife or a machete of sorts. Which, it's always nice to see a custom weapon in a Half-Life mod. We immediately use it to stab down a zombie. In the same room we also see a news broadcast. It confirms that this mod is indeed taking place in the Netherlands. It also talks about the fact that the economy is starting to recover after the portal storms started appearing. Which is an interesting new perspective into the Half-Life world. After moving down the apartment with our newfound melee, a Vortigaunt appears in front of us. Seemingly trying to communicate that we are fighting on the same side. We then wake up in front of the building, where we see someone else leaning against the glass. His name is John, and he's a pretty important character. The voice acting is done pretty well, and so are his animations. I didn't see you there just now. I thought this building was deserted. Well, it doesn't matter. I'm just lucky I ran into you. Great work by the team. We eventually meet up with him and he asks for a rest at our place. The news play once again and we get more context. A huge portal has appeared somewhere in the Netherlands and it is bigger than usual. From all it seems, portals are a part of the daily life on Earth now. So are the creatures. We are post Zen, but no combine are to be seen anywhere. In this moment, Vortigons teleport in and we fight them off. Even the Vortigons are still hostile at this point. We abandon the house and move to a tunnel outside. By the way, for a model supposed to take place in the Netherlands, there is literally only one bike. My rating for this mod is 0 out of 10. We then clear what is like a total of 60 zombies using our melee. The melee really sucks to use, but perhaps this is more immersive? We then enter said tunnel and fall down a hole. Small note, all the loading screens have hints on them, which is pretty cool. We are in a very strange canal-like place. John questions where we are as well. We also magically receive a shotgun, which is cool. This and basically the rest of the game give me heavy cry of fear vibes. This is not a horror mod at all and you don't feel scared for some reason. I suck at horror games because I get scared so easily, but somehow this isn't creepy. Which, good job for somehow achieving that. I think John helps. By the way, I think this mod crashes at every single map load, so get used to using the console in order to progress, as you can't bite the button and basically can't open the console even using the launch options. I opted to going into the CFG files and binding a button for the console. Yeah, playing this mod is quite the pain, but it's worth it, I promise. After a bit of puzzle solving, radio fiddling and finding easter eggs, which there are quite a lot that can be found throughout this mod. We get ambushed by soldiers. These are completely new designs as it seems, not anything seen before in the Half-Life universe. And we also don't know who they are and why they are attacking us, neither how they found us. Perhaps through the radio, who knows. The shotgun is awesome by the way, it feels very similar to the Half-Life 2 shotgun and also has the same sounds. It is spotting a brand new design though, which I love. These canal levels last for quite a while. We also find a new enemy here, which is a reskin of the Zombine, minus the grenades. During these levels, John tries to think of where we are going. We decide then that we are going to Amsterdam, since that town is mostly still standing. A quick note on the combat of this mod, I think it is its weak point. The weapons are great, no complaints at all on that front. It's just that the combat is simply a bunch of empty arenas that get spammed with enemies. This combined with the fact that there is close on auto saving, f***ing hell. We eventually find this rock kind of thing with glowing stones on it that seems to have crashed through the ceiling. This is very similar to the rocks that came from the sky that were seen in Human Error. 
which I'm pretty sure this mod is referencing here, giving that a literal poster of human error is found not long after. We find notes in a room next to a dead body. These further explain that the rocks came falling from the sky. In case you don't know what human error is, be sure to check out my video I uploaded on it a couple weeks ago. From these notes we also learned that the Black Mesa incident happened 10 years ago. This sounds pretty weird and we will definitely be getting into law discussion later on, as not everything has yet been revealed. After fighting about 40 soldiers in a helicopter on our own, we find a guy named Mike, the second custom character of this mod. The voice acting here is also pretty good. Thank you so very much. If it wasn't for you, I'm pretty sure the military would have gotten to me. The soldiers have been after us for the entire time of this mod, but they are definitely after Mike as of right now. He has some secret research hidden in his mansion, which is right behind him. He has locked himself out though and thinks a lot of creatures are inside. This is of course no problem for us. We storm into the building, guns blazing and fight off the creatures with our giant arsenal. By the way, I love the M4 of this mod. Great damage and great feel. This house is pretty puzzly, involving us finding a lot of keys and unlocking doors. This chapter is called Residence Evil and this map does give off Resident Evil vibes. I like it. We also find a great new enemy here, the baby headcrab poison zombie. Once you kill this guy, about 30 baby headcrabs will come flying out of him. This is a great callback to the baby headcrab scene when fighting the Gonark and possibly a pre-evolution of the poison zombie as we know him from Half-Life 2. I love this enemy. We then hear John and Mike having some trouble over the radio. Soldiers spotted them. After fighting off some soldiers ourselves, we reset the mainframe of the building and we move into the basement alongside John and Mike, who thankfully made it out alive. In this basement we find a portal gun. Mike explains that this is the research he was talking about. He also explained that the company went bankrupt and that he's still working on it. So this basically attempts to tie in the portal law by saying that Aperture Science went bankrupt. For anyone that ever made the connection, Portal and half life universes are connected. Thus far only suddenly and there are many questions left open. Like for example where Aperture Science was during Half-Life. This is one way of explaining it. Mike says he will stay behind but we should go and find the guy named Brian in an observatory who will hopefully be able to help us get to Amsterdam. We find a barn with a ton of missing people posters. By looking at them a girl named Marissa approaches us. She seems kinda weird I must say, a bit spooky. She says she takes care of these posters because they give her hope. Her old family is missing. John, upon taking a closer look at the posters, finds himself on them. His brother Jason is looking for him and is currently in Amsterdam. We thank Marissa and continue on our way to find Brian. Also you can find a lot of references looking at these posters. I think this scene is very interesting and for some reason kind of ominous. I like it. Later on we find a house. In it are a lot of dead vortigons, civilians and soldiers. John begins to question why the soldiers are targeting us. It's right at this moment that a person emerges behind us. This person is called Sergeant Bennett. He asks us what we are doing here. After explaining things to him, he tells us what's going on. Basically, the soldiers are mercenary of the Omega Squad. He also says that them going for civilians complicates things and that this isn't standard behavior for them. He usually can't disclose stuff with civilians like us. He also says he isn't part of them. Chris, which is his first name, further explains that his squad was wiped out by the Omega Squad. The Omega Squad is part of the Blackstone Corporation. It's a non-government organization that deals with the fallout of the Resonance Cascade, usually taking contracts from governments that are still in place. But they also seem to have a sort of hidden agenda. Chris doesn't know why they are here. Chris also says that his radio is no longer functional and that he needs to gather data about a portal storm and then relay back to his HQ. We then start working together. We need to get him to our communication center and observatory and in return, he'll help us get to Amsterdam by EVAC. More portals appear, including one right over our house which leads to us having to fight a few Vortigons. Eventually we arrive at the observatory. But the computers are all locked down. After getting into the research station to unlock the computers, in which we also find a dead Brian, rest in peace, Chris is able to get enough data on the portal. We leave the pace and get ambushed once more. Another case of a ton of enemy spam. As I said, combat really isn't this mod's strongest point. If it wasn't for the weapons being so fun, this would basically be completely unenjoyable. After fleeing, we find our last hope in a sign pointing towards a restaurant, I must say I've rarely seen actual restaurants in Half-Life mods. We kill about another third soldiers. In the restaurant we find a radio. We listen to the Omega Squad's communication and hear them talking to a very weird voice. All insurgencies have resulted in loss of all available units in sight of the town. The operation has been cancelled until new orders arrive. I'll also save this for the law discussion. But that voice does sound familiarly weird. Chris tells us to find a military base and tell him everything we've experienced. Him and John will stay behind in order to capture one of the Omega Squad soldiers for questioning. To get there we drive a Mustang found outside of the restaurant. Hell yeah. This sadly only lasts for a short while as we arrive at a roadblock in a church. Inside the church we find a ton of supplies. As you might guess from all these supplies, another 30 soldiers come storming in right at us. 
Tris and John arrive at the church to help, to which these weird bodyguards come teleporting in. They are also able to teleport around the place, an interesting enemy with a huge health pool. The teleporting is very similar to that of the temporal crabs of Entropy Zero 2, which I'm sure both got their code from the same source. After fighting up a few of them, we arrive at the end of this mod and what is possibly the coolest headpiece I've ever seen in a Half-Life mod. Check this out. What the hell, dude? This can't be happening! Is this for real? I know, John. It's beyond anything I've ever seen. I love this. We have never seen this before, and I don't think it could have been executed much better. The combat invasion starts right in front of our eyes. This is so awesome. Now, before getting into the lore discussion, we do have to talk about the DLC of this mod. Yep, DLC. It released about two years after this mod did. So in 2012, and it is free. Now, I've mentioned that installing this mod sucks, but this is where it gets real crazy. Basically, once you install this DLC, it will make the main campaign unplayable. Make a backup of your mod. Overwrite the files with the files of Rogue Train and it's fixed and there you go. I also had to delete the media folder as it was causing crashes. With this DLC we can play a new bonus map in which you play a Black Ops soldier called Slumdog. I originally thought this was referencing the Black Ops of Half-Life 1, though Yaure, the main developer of this mod, did let me know that Slumdog is actually part of the Omega Squad. It's basically just a fun map in which we fight through a train filled with zombies to disarm bombs, hack thingies and try to stop the train. Later on in the mod we find the changed vortigons in a wagon, which is weird. Shortly afterwards, the train gets overrun by the military, this time being some kind of spec ops trying to deal with the Omega Squad. After reaching the front of the train, we see this guy called Marcus. He rambles for about 5 minutes. He basically says that humanity is doomed and that we need to evolve. And as if he knew the exact timing, the common invasion portal opens. We see the same thing seen at the end of 1187 from another angle. We also get about 3 seconds of extended story here. We hear John speak over the radio looking for help. Which is pretty cool. It shows that he did indeed survive. Before I can get into the lore discussion, I'll show you some new info that I got exclusively from Yaude. To kinda explain who Yaude is, the team behind this mod has basically fully split up these days. Team GT was her name. They kinda morphed into Team V afterwards and went on to create Stardrop. Stardrop had a bit of a success on Steam from all it seems, with 217 reviews that are overall very positive. It looks pretty good, so go check it out if you're interested. It's also currently on sale. Clicking on Yaude's name takes you to Team V, which seemed to be his new team of devs. Checking the Discord, he has since moved on and basically became a solo developer. He has also released another game called Play with Gilbert, which seems to be a children's game about a cat. If either of those games seem interesting to you, definitely go check those out. So yeah, I went ahead and asked Yaude himself on Discord on the status of episode 2 and some lore questions, which he was glad to answer. So exclusive news everyone, Yaude said that episode 2 was well into pre-production. It was then though that he got offered to join the Contagion team, Contagion being a sore zombie game on Steam. Once that fell apart though, he moved on to Unreal Engine 4 and made his own games. He also said that he doesn't think he could go back to make an episode 2 these days. He also apologizes to all people that were waiting for a continuation. He did however provide me with some plans he had for episode 2 and some of the lore. Episode 2 would have taken place somewhere in Amsterdam, only a couple hours after episode 1 ended, so right during the 7 hour war. John and Chris would have joined whatever small militia was able to set up. The situation would have been bleak though, especially given that we know the outcome already. This bleak vibe would have been the overall theme of episode 2. He also doesn't remember a lot of the lore. He remembers reading a lot about the Half-Life timeline in the wiki and trying to fit his mod into it. He also isn't sure what things were changed since the release of Half-Life Alex. The one aspect he found fascinating about 1187 and the Seven Hour War was the aspect of an alien invasion. He says that he would love to do his original IP about it, which would retell certain aspects of 1187 episode 1 and 2, but would be something completely different and more grounded in reality. Probably more of a horror story. He says that the scope of such a project is the problem. I'm gonna head into the lore discussion for now, before showing you what the author has confirmed outside of what could be found through just playing. Okay, so now for the lore discussion. The Rogue Train DLC showed us that the Omega Squad, under the guiding of Marcus, is working for the Combine. For one, it's their conversation we hear over the radio, which sounds like an advisor on the other end. Portals appeared everywhere they went, and Marcus basically all but confirms them working together in a speech to Slumdog. So we got that. Now onto a whole different discussion. Could this mod be canon? I think for the very most part it fits perfectly. There is however one point of contention. The letters mentioning that it has been 10 years since the Black Mesa incident. 
Is it plausible that the Combines invasion began 10 years after the Black Mesa incident? Well, this depends. There is evidence speaking to both. Let's go to the source itself in the form of Mark Laidlaw. As a reference, we use the Combine Over Wiki page for Mark Laidlaw emails. On the time between the Black Mesa incident and the 7 hour war. Ah, yes, perfect. Days. Well, damn. But this isn't the end all be all, really. For now, let's take Mark Laidlaw saying days with a grain of salt, especially given this fact. According to Alex, she doesn't remember the Black Mesa incident. But once the potted storms in episode 2 start, she says, quote, It's like the first days all over again. Which means she remembers the common invasion. This would most likely put a few years in between the events. As long as we assume that her not remembering the Black Mesa incident is not due to G-Man wiping her memory. To add onto that, in Half-Life Alex, which takes place 5 years before Half-Life 2 Episode 2, the Citadel is still being built. The developers have stated that the Citadel was indeed teleported in from the Combine world. It was just being added onto in Half-Life Alex. For one to assume the Combine came in immediately after the Black Mesa incident, this would mean that the Citadel was being built for approximately 15 years, if we do assume Half-Life 2 takes place 20 years after Half-Life 1. If we were going with the timeline of 1187, they would have at most been building on it for 5 years, which does seem more likely. All of this is a very complicated way of saying that this could in theory be Half-Life canon, if a little unlikely. You can also just choose to swap out the amount of years for like one year, which makes the story work way better. Yaudo himself said that if he could change this today, he would simply make it a bit more vague. As for what Yaudo said about the lore, for one, he thinks that the Omega Squad isn't fully aware of what Marcos did, but they were working for him. They were used for nefarious operations, but they were never in the loop completely. Marcos himself had ties to the military and could pull some strings. Also, Chris was originally part of the Omega Squad himself. Chris stopped associating with them though because he wanted to figure out what was going on and was suspicious of their activities. Regarding the portal gun in Mike's basement, I was kind of right about that. He simply wanted the two universes to be more connected. Given he is a huge portal fan himself and loved the rivalry between the two companies. Speaking on the Vortigons, he thinks today he would have attempted a more diverse approach, making some but not all hostile towards the player. The Vortigons seen at the end are once captured by humans. They were experimented on and basically mind controlled. He himself admits that this is a bit meh in terms of story, but adds on that Marcus is the one behind that. He likes them as an enemy type, but would reduce the health as they were too spongy for him. He would have made them more friendly in episode 2 and would have John be one of the people to make friends with them, saying that John is just that kind of dude. I ask him about the protagonist, why the things that are happening to him are happening. He doesn't really have too much of an explanation. He's kinda just a regular person, not quite like Freeman. He compares him more to Shepard, not a main player, but still important enough for the G-Men to see use in. I also asked him about the human error references. He said that this might be the case, but he simply forgot over the years. The rocks with the crystals on them were definitely meant to symbolize the potted storms though. As for Law in episode 2, John would have survived. He didn't speak on the fate of Chris. The protagonist would have been put back into stasis. Yaro said he never decided on if John would have found his brother. Also, there was this early development screenshot. These two characters would have been new characters that were never fully developed. So from a final review. 1187 is definitely severely underrated and is sadly very hard to install and play. The constant crashes and complicated installation do not make it very accessible, especially for people who don't know their way around the console. By the way, if you do crash on a map load, the chapters are corresponding to the specific maps. You can also type sv underscore unlock chapters 100 into the console to unlock all chapters. If you do manage to play it through, you will have a great time. The weapons are awesome. Having to use iron sights is pretty fun. The M4 definitely overpowers all other weapons though. The new enemy types are fun, especially the baby headcrab zombie. Sadly, it is literally only seen once. The level design is generally pretty good as well. The vibe of this mod is probably its strongest point. It's a very weird post-apocalyptic feeling. Probably true to how an alien invasion would play out in real life. Everything is still kinda normal, but people are dying everywhere. Exploring this part of the timeline of Half-Life is incredibly interesting. The cry of your vibe in a non-horror environment works surprisingly well. The cast of characters are great and as I've mentioned in previous videos, making characters talk and gesture in a source mod is an ungrateful, tremendous effort with what seems like minimal payoff, but in reality it adds a ton to the atmosphere of a mod. The mod has an awesome custom soundtrack, which I have been playing in the background of this video the entire time. The custom textures and models are also great. There aren't too many, but it distances this mod just enough from the usual Half-Life aesthetic to be very unique and set out next to most other mods. Overall, I give this mod an 8 out of 10. Simply due to the fact how hard it is to get running these days. Of course, this isn't the modder's fault. It's that of the Steam Pipe update in 2013. Otherwise, this mod would have gotten a 10 out of 10 rating. Which I will just simply make my final rating as I love this mod. So yeah, I hope you enjoyed this video. Huge shout out to Yaudel for taking the time to answer my questions. Be sure to check out his other projects if you're interested. Otherwise, thank you for watching. Play on the bonus map. Or you can replay the crash course again.